Good evening. More on that breaking news shortly. The Times new reporting. But first, we have the book. CNN has the book that everyone inside the White House and anyone outside the interested in politics is either talking about, worrying about, laughing about, or furious about. Fire and Fury, Michael Wolff's White House expose. Late last night, the president's lawyers tried to block it, and the publisher, in defiance, advanced the release date to tomorrow. We've got a copy right now. We've been going through it. Before today, just excerpts were available. As you know, the book, sourced heavily to fired White House chief strategist Steve Bannon, is already rocking 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue for its portrayal of chaos and dysfunction. Well, now there's much, much more from him on the first family, Jared Kushner especially, and Bannon's feud with him, James Comey, the Russia probe, and more. We should begin by noting that some of Michael Wolff's reporting has been corroborated. Some errors have already been identified. One person, he quotes, said she never said those things to him. Another who took part in a dinner he writes about verifies his account of that down to the word, and she joins us shortly. We should also say that Wolf paints quite a few scenes without directly quoting anyone, and his sourcing at times is vague. Here's what he says about that in the book's preface. Preface, quote, it is worth noting some of the journalistic conundrums that I faced when dealing with the Trump administration, many of them the result of the White House's absence of official procedures and the lack of experience of its principles. Wolf continues, these challenges have included dealing with off the record or deep background material that was later casually put on the record. Sources who provided accounts and confidence and subsequently shared them widely as though liberated by their first utterances. A frequent inattention to setting any parameters on the use of a conversation. A source's views being so well known and widely shared that it would be risible not to credit them. And the almost Zamedzdat sharing of gobsmacked retelling of otherwise private and deep background conversations. Wolf also notes... And everywhere in this story is the president's own constant, tireless, and uncontrolled voice, public and private, shared by others on a daily basis, sometimes virtually as he utters it. So bear that in mind as we bring you certain passages that do not contain direct quotations, but do appear to make news. As for the direct quotes, Steve Bannon has not disputed any of the ones attributed to him. and We've attempted to get comment from many of the other names that you'll be hearing tonight. We begin with Wolf's description of the moments aboard Air Force One, the president returning from his Europe trip. Just after news of the Trump Tower meeting hit, Don Jr., Jared Kushner, and Paul Manafort meeting with Russians claiming to have dirt on Hillary Clinton. This is significant because those moments could form the basis for cover-up allegations. Quote, the president insisted that the meeting in Trump Tower was purely and simply about Russian adoption policy. That's what was discussed, period, period even though it was likely, if not certain, that the Times had the incriminating email chain. In fact, it was quite possible that Jared and Ivanka and the lawyers knew the Times had this email chain. The president ordered that no one should let on to the more problematic discussion about Hillary Clinton. Quote, it was a real-time example, he writes, of denial and cover-up. That, of course, remains to be seen, and we'll talk about that tonight. Jim Acosta joins us now from the White House, where Press Secretary Sarah Sanders took aim at the book. Jim, uh, what more did the White House have to say today about this book? Well, you heard Sarah Sanders during the press briefing today describe this book as a book full of lies. Uh, But I asked uh, Sarah Sanders during the briefing about that claim, uh, considering the fact that the White House gave Michael Wolff Uh, what appears to be unprecedented access to multiple officials, including Steve Bannon, inside the White House. Here's what she had to say about that. You were uh, calling the uh, Michael Wolff book a book full of lies. Uh, Didn't this White House give Michael Wolff all the access that he wanted? Absolutely not. In fact, there are uh, probably more than 30 requests for access uh, to information from Michael Wolff that were repeatedly denied, including... uh, Within that, at least two dozen requests of him asking to have an interview with the president, which he never did. He never discussed this book with the president. And to me, that would be the most important voice that you could have if you were looking to write a book about an individual would be to have some time with him. He never did. He was repeatedly denied that, I think, because we saw him for what he was. And there was no reason for us to waste the president of the United States time. Now, we should point out uh, the White House continues to be in in blame Bannon mode for all of this. I talked to a White House official earlier this evening who essentially said that Bannon was responsible uh, for clearing Wolf into the White House. 
uh, for most of these visits that he had over here. But when you hear what Michael Wolf is saying or read what he's saying, especially what he wrote in The Hollywood Reporter earlier today, that basically all he had to do was call somebody over here and he was uh, invited into the White House. It does appear he had extraordinary access to officials over here, uh, Anderson. And, uh, you know, it is just like uh, the, the kind of access we've never seen anybody have over here before. Uh, for the production of a book, uh, at least during this administration. He also talks in The Hollywood Reporter uh, today about uh, sort of the the atmosphere inside near the Oval Office and, and basically sitting in the hall and kind of being able to see the comings and goings of Kellyanne Conway and Steve Bannon and Gary Cohn and all these people. Uh, that's right. And, uh, in, and like I was saying, you know, we uh, in the press corps have seen uh, Michael Wolff come and go over here at the White House. And so it did sound a bit incredulous when uh, the White House, when the press secretary was saying earlier today, uh, well, you know, this is a book full of lies. It's it's tabloid trash and so on. Uh, and yet it was the White House that was allowing Michael Wolff to come in here time and again to talk to officials here. Uh, apparently he was talking to Steve Bannon time and again uh, and was not obstructed by anybody inside this administration. It was only when uh, these revelations came out that they really turned on this book uh, and turned on Steve Bannon. Up until this point, we really did not hear much of a peep out of this White House in terms of any kind of condemnation of this book. And, of course, uh, you saw the White House trying to uh, put the kibosh on this book, uh, sending out these threatening letters to Steve Bannon uh, and the publisher of Michael Wolff's book. Uh, that only served to accelerate interest in the book, and now it's been rushed to uh, release. It's coming out tomorrow morning. Uh, it, it is rather extraordinary to see how the White, White House has handled the fallout from all of this, but it, it's pretty typical of how they deal with damage control. Uh, they, they tend to deal with it after the fact uh, when they really could have dealt with it months ago by not giving Michael Wolff as much access as he had. Right. And they've certainly given the book uh, a lot more attention than, I mean, it would have gotten attention anyway, but uh, I mean, I certainly. guess they had to respond in some way. But, but the, the president right. tweeting the way he did or making that statement that he did uh, certainly gave it, uh, you know, a front page. And, and uh, make no mistake, Anderson, yeah. they're reading it behind the scenes at the White House. There are a few copies circulating inside the West Wing. They know what's in this book. Uh, and it seems that uh, when this book comes out to the public tomorrow, they're going to be responding to more revelations than what we've seen so far. All right. Uh, appreciate it, Jim. We mentioned at the top of the broadcast that new report in The New York Times, the headline, Obstruction Inquiry Shows Trump's Struggle to Keep Grip on Russia Investigation. One of the reporters, or Maggie Haberman, joins us now on the phone. Maggie, explain what... Uh, what, what you have learned, what's in this? Sure. This is, I would like to just be clear, this is primarily Mike Schmidt, my colleague's reporting, um, and, and he did a terrific job. He came up with uh, very detailed reporting about how Don McGahn, uh, the White House counsel, went at the urging of the president to the attorney general uh, and asked him not to recuse from the Russia probe, which, as we know, Jeff Sessions did without telling the president he was going to do it in advance, made the president very angry. He's been angry about it ever since. It has set off a chain reaction ever since. Um, the, uh, uh, the idea that uh, McGahn would go do this uh, knowing that this was potentially problematic is striking. When the president was told that uh, Sessions was still going to recuse himself, um, the president was very angry, um, fumed that he needed to be personally protected, uh, wanted some kind of a relationship between himself and the AG, uh, the way he believed that uh, Bobby Kennedy had protected John F. Kennedy. This is how he uh, cited it. Uh, Mike also learned that Four days before James Comey was fired, an aide to Jeff Sessions went to Capitol Hill looking for, quote-unquote, dirt on Comey. Um, the timing is quite notable. Wait a minute. I just want you to repeat that. Uh, four days before Comey was fired, an aide mm -hmm. of, of Sessions? Yes, looking for dirt, quote-unquote. Went to Capitol Hill looking for negative information about James Comey. Do we know at whose behest that person did that? We don't, but it was somebody working for Jeff Sessions. Uh, you know, I, it's not clear to me whether Sessions directly knew or didn't directly know, but it was certainly coming from uh, the Department of Justice. And just to be clear, you said, uh, talked about Don McCann going to try to convince Jeff Sessions not to recuse himself. He was doing that, according to this reporting, at the order of President Trump. Correct. The president wanted to be personally protected by the attorney general uh, with regard to the Russia probe. This is about as, this is the, the clearest most um, substantial reporting we have seen about what the president demanded uh, and what he wanted of the attorney general with regard to this probe. 
Uh, Maggie Haberman from the New York Times uh, talking about reporting uh, from her and uh, mostly from uh, Michael Schmidt, as she pointed out. Thank you very much, Maggie. I want to bring in CNN chief legal analyst Jeff Tubin, Georgetown University Law School's uh, Carrie Cordero. She's a CNN legal analyst as well. Jeff, what is the significance of this? That this is potentially more evidence that the president was obstructing justice uh, in connection with the Comey investigation. I mean, here you have the, the whole reason Jeff Sessions recused himself from um, the, the Russia investigation is that he knew he was part of what the Russia investigation was going to be investigating. It was appropriate for him to uh, recuse himself. By trying to undo that decision through his counsel, um, uh, Don McGahn, uh, the president is showing that he wanted to be protected from that investigation. That is what obstruction of justice is. Now, this alone, I don't think, uh, would amount to a crime in and of itself. But when you look at the pattern of, of behavior, whether it is firing James Comey for conducting this investigation, whether it is telling Lester Holt, telling the Russian visitors that he fired James Comey because of the Russia investigation, all of it adds up to the potential for a charge of obstruction of justice against the president. And the Times reporting today is another brick in that wall. Carrie, uh, how do you see this? Well, Donald Trump, as a candidate and now as president, has a fundamentally flawed understanding of the role of the attorney general and the role of the Justice Department. And he thought on the campaign, he apparently has still thought that throughout his first year as president, that the uh, Department of Justice and the prosecutors and investigators are a arm of the White House. And he doesn't understand the independence that the attorney general uh, needs to have. Jeff Sessions, whether people disagree with his politics, with his policy positions, or whether the with the policy direction that he's taken the Justice Department, in probably the most important decision he had to make, which was recusing himself in the Russia investigation, he did the right thing. And he adhered to the ethics advice from the professional ethics lawyers in the department that the right thing to do was to recuse from that investigation. And if this new New York Times is uh, correct, this new New York Times report that's just coming out is correct, then he did so under tremendous political pressure from the White House counsel, which was coming from the president. Uh, Jeff, the idea that someone who works for an aide to Jeff Sessions went to Capitol Hill to, uh, according to the New York Times, find dirt on Comey four days before Comey was fired, how significant is that? Well, it, 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 it suggests that, that the president was determined to fire James Comey for w whatever reason. I mean, what, why it's significant that he's looking for dirt is that it suggests that he made up the he made the decision to fire him and after the fact tried tried to find a justification for it i mean that that's the implication of this uh, uh, of this reporting in the times that contrary uh, to the original explanation for firing James Comey, which was that the president disapproved of how mean he was to Hillary Clinton, which was really a preposterous explanation um, from the very beginning, it suggests that there was a different reason and the president was looking for justifications to, um, to support uh, to support firing him, but the decision to fire him had already been made. Kerry, is there any conflict that the fact that this person was, uh, you know, uh, an aide to Jeff Sessions and Jeff Sessions, uh, you know, had recused himself from anything to do with Russia, whereas where Comey uh, obviously was dealing with the Russian investigation? It's just an odd thing uh, to think about that an aide to the attorney general would be going to Capitol Hill to look for quote, dirt. I, I don't even know sort of what that means, looking for dirt on Jim Comey. What, what would seem a little bit um, more likely would be that they would go to Capitol Hill if this happened to look for political support 
for firing James Comey. In other words, they knew that there were perhaps Democrats on the Hill who were unhappy with how he handled the Clinton matter. And so maybe they were looking for support. I really I don't understand at all why anybody, let alone an advisor to the attorney general, would go to Capitol Hill looking for some kind of derogatory information on him. But it also, uh, if true, just sort of supports the understanding that the reason for firing the FBI director was concocted and was not based on any merit related reason or anything um, related to his performance in his role as FBI director. Uh, Jeff, can, and, and, yeah, go ahead, Jeff. Well, I, I just, you know, the one thing this report really does is it cries out for Don McGahn to give public testimony before Congress about what he did. I mean, you know, we, Can, what, you, but could he do that? I mean, if he was acting at the behest of the president, is it, isn't that covered by, I mean, is it covered by attorney-client privilege or by, by it, presidential? It, uh, not, not attorney-client. I mean, the, the argument perhaps would be executive privilege. Right. But remember, the key moment in the Watergate, uh, in, in the Watergate uh, uh, congressional hearings was the testimony of John Dean, who held the exact same job uh, as uh, as Don McGahn holds now, and he testified at great length and incriminate and, and in an incriminating way about his conversations with President Nixon. Hmm. It seems entirely incumbent upon Don McGahn, given the very questionable nature of this exchange, that he should be required to tell. Uh, Congress and thus the American people, what the heck was going on? Although, Jeff, I mean, and, you know, the number of people from this White House who have testified, who have invoked, you know, not executive privilege because it wasn't officially invoked uh, by the White House, but it, but some, you know, uninvented form of that of, well, I just don't want to tell you my conversations with the president because I don't think I should. Um, it seems like everyone else has done it. Why wouldn't Don McGahn do that? Well, he might, but we never know. You, you know, Congress never knows until I, I, until it asks. And and you know, look, we, the 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 fundamental fact of these congressional investigations is that Republicans are in charge. Republicans are in the House, rep in charge in the House, and they're in charge in the Senate. And these investigations seem much more designed to protect President uh, Trump than to investigate him. Okay, but. That doesn't mean those of us who are following it from the outside shouldn't say that Congress should do its job and get these people under oath and find out what yeah. they knew and what they did. Jeff Kerry, if you will, just stay with us. We're joined as well by former senior White House advisors David Gergen and David Axelrod. David, uh, David Gergen, um, you've read this uh, New York Times reporting. What To you, what is the significance? Well, I, I agree with, uh, absolutely with what Jeff Tubin has been saying, and that is it adds to the pattern. Uh, I'm not sure the, the sending McGahn over to the Justice Department is in and of itself uh, would qualify as an act of obstruction, but seeing it within that pattern, I think it has a lot more weight. Um, I, I, I do believe there is a question uh, in, in the impeachment, any kind of impeachment proceedings, if there is an obstruction of justice, is there an underlying crime? Uh, that, that that can 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 you have an obstruction if there's not a crime, and that will then depend heavily on what Mueller comes up with regard to uh, the uh, the collusion issue, or possibly the money laundering issue. So we'll have to wait and see exactly where this goes. One of the curious things I find here is sending someone from the Justice Department to find dirt on Comey. I've never heard of anything like that except for the Nixon days, uh, and it does raise questions: Who was this person and who sent him? Uh, because was it was it the attorney general who had already recused himself? Was it the number two in the Justice Department who's now running things? Where did that order come from? That's a really peculiar, odd uh, circumstance. And I do think it, it, it represents a lot of skullduggery. David, uh, David Axrod, is this I mean, having worked in, in the Obama White House, is this just an odd <laughs> sequence of events? Well, odd, I think, would be a polite way to describe it. I mean, there, there is. <laughs> It is so it is so foreign to me, having worked in the White House and knowing how scrupulously uh, people uh, dealt with the Justice Department, the FBI, uh, the notion of a president sending his uh, White House counsel over to uh, persuade the uh, the attorney general not to recuse himself. And now we knew that Trump wasn't happy with that decision. But now this act of actually involving himself through his counsel and trying to persuade him, that is new information. And, and I think what's particularly disturbing is this 
description of uh, Trump's reasoning that the attorney general's job is to protect him. He said, where's my Roy Cohn? Roy Cohn being a particularly despicable figure in American history, who was the right hand man of Joe McCarthy. Also, by the way, a, an early mentor of Donald Trump, uh, but uh, and, and a notorious fixer. Uh, so uh, the notion that the attorney general's job is to protect the president and protect him from what? What is it that the president feared? Uh, I do think that this is going to add momentum uh, to what is already a, uh, a, a roaring fire here. Yeah, David Axelrod, I mean, it is fascinating that, you know, given Je- uh, Jeff Sessions' early sign on to the Trump campaign and, you know, traveling with the president, being a surrogate for the president, it is fascinating that the president would somehow believe that he appoints him attorney general and he's going to continue basically being his, you know, Roy Cohn or, or, or uh, you know, Bobby Kennedy. Well, there's no doubt that he that's what he believed, that uh, that that this was his role to protect uh, to protect the president. The irony of all of this is it comes on a day when two members of Congress uh, called for sessions to uh, be dismissed. And of course, that's exactly what the president would want now, because if he had an attorney general who wasn't involved in the campaign and wasn't involved in this Russia uh, matter, then that attorney general would then take control of the investigation and Mueller would have to respond to that uh, attorney general. So it's quite a tangled web here. David Gergen, do you agree with Jeff that uh, Dom Dom McGahn should be called to testify? Well, I I do. I I do. But I I think what we have to rely on is the far more serious investigation that is underway by Bob Mueller. And I would assume that uh, that he's been called and has testified or will testify soon, soon because he's an absolutely essential piece now of this puzzle. And and it's it's essential for the investigations. You know, what is What has been sort of disheartening is the way the investigations are stalling out on Capitol Hill. and, And they look more and more like partisan bickering within the investigatory bodies than they do like serious investigations that they were proclaimed to be when we started down this path. We're almost entirely reliant now on the Bob Mueller team. Jeff Tubin, just explain again you, the, you, the, your belief in the significance of, of this. I mean, the, to you, uh, this doesn't necessarily point out obstruction. No, it is not in and of itself a, a, an, an obstruction of justice. But if you have a, a theory that the, uh, that the president's actions um, you know, during the, the, the period of the, you know, the first several months of his presidency represented a pattern, a conspiracy to obstruct justice, to stop or interfere with the investigation of his campaign uh, and, and Russia. This is uh, another piece of evidence that supports that theory. The reason it's a, it, it supports that theory is that uh, Jeff Sessions was trying to do the right thing. He was recognizing that he was too involved with the Trump campaign in order to lead an investigation of the Trump campaign. I mean, it's just, you know, basic legal ethics that Jeff Sessions was reflecting. And by by interfering at that decision or trying to interfere with that decision through his through his uh, his White House counsel, Don McGahn, that suggests that the president didn't want an inter- an independent investigation of of the rush uh, of the Trump yeah. campaign. Yeah. He wanted to control that investigation. And that could be seen as part of a conspiracy to obstruct justice. David and Anderson, it's just as clear as it can be now that the president feels he's, there are things to be hidden. He does not want out in the public. And now the publication of this book is beginning to give us an understanding of why. Uh, Kerry, let me ask you, just from a legal standpoint, if Don McGahn has, uh, assuming Don McGahn has talked to Robert Mueller, been asked to, to interview with Robert Mueller, is executive privilege something he could cite in that interview to not answer questions? I think he probably would um, because the White House seems to be, although they're not really clear about doing it in the different public congressional testimonies that we've seen, they seem to be asserting um, various uh, variations of the executive privilege. But I would just add that even before this report tonight, there is reason to think that the White House counsel 
is already in a position of being a witness to obstruction to the extent that he was knowledgeable about the president's intent to fire the FBI director, um, to uh, do other things that the president uh, did sort of last spring, early summer to try to shut down the Russia investigation, both before the special counsel was appointed and after. I think when we look at obstruction, if we ever do see an obstruction case brought, whether it is through the special counsel's office or whether it it is in the political arena. Um, what we will see is a pattern of obstruction that that brought together makes a case of obstruction. It's not going to be one specific act, but the White House counsel has been there for many different conversations. And um, certainly, I think at this point, it's a question regarding his continued effectiveness in the position of White House counsel if, in fact, he is a witness in an obstruction investigation. And, and Anderson, can yeah. I just address something David mentioned a little earlier, which was the legal question of can you have obstruction of justice if you don't have an underlying right. crime? And that's a, the, the courts have dealt with that question many times, and they have always said, yes, you can have, you can charge someone with obstruction of justice without charging them, much less convicting them, of an underlying crime. As, as a legal matter in front of the courts, there's no question that, that that issue is settled. However, if you're talking about impeachment, Congress can decide whatever they want in terms of uh, the, the legal standards there. So if Congress decides you can't have obstruction of justice without an underlying crime, well, that's, you know, th that's the end of that story. So, you know, we're dealing in two very different worlds here. The courts have very strict rules. Congress o operates very much by yeah. its own rules. Just finally, David Axelrod. Can, can, I, can I, I? Let me just ask yeah. you quickly, David. Kerry uh, made a point ahead, about... Yeah. You know, Don McGahn is, a, is a kind of a, a, at the epicenter of a lot of conversations. Where does the mm -hmm. loyalty of the White House counsel lie? I, is it to the president uh, as an individual? Is it to the White House as an institution? Well, I, look, I think that the uh, his loyalty uh, is is uh, to the president, I, I believe, and the and the White House. But let, let me just let me just pick up on one other point okay. and repurpose your question, Anderson, sure. which is uh, earlier it was mentioned that McGahn could answer uh, some important questions. One important question he can answer goes to this question of whether there was a cover-up of a crime. He knows what the acting attorney general told him about what General Flynn had done. And did he, was he told and did he tell the president that General Flynn had lied to the FBI, which he's now pled guilty to? If the president knew that and then asked the FBI director to drop the matter... Uh, it seems to me that, that that advances the case. Well, we should also point out Don McGahn is the person that Sally Yates came to uh, and, and met at the White House to explain what she had learned about, exactly. about Michael Flynn. Um, uh, he right. was the, the point of contact. Jeff Kerry, David Gergen, David Axrod, thank you. We're going to be back shortly to some of the legal heat on the president that Michael Wolff's book may document. One of the people from One Vivid Scene joins us shortly. Want more than just the headlines? Join me, Don Lemon, on CNN Tonight for a no-holds-barred breakdown of all the day's top stories. CNN Tonight with Don Lemon, weeknights at 10 Eastern on CNN. Well, in a night of blockbusters, more now in Michael Wolff's blockbuster in the book, which CNN has obtained. Wolff describes in great detail, detail a dinner party attended by Steve Bannon and fired Fox News boss Roger Ailes. Now, when this passage came out yesterday, people asked how he could have been so precise. Turns out he hosted the dinner, and one of the other guests, Janice Min, part owner of The Hollywood Reporter, tweeted about it, saying, So I was one of the six guests at the Bannon Ailes dinner party in January 2017, and every word I've seen from the book about it is absolutely accurate. It was an astonishing night. Janice Min joins us now. Janice, thanks for, for being here. Um, first of all, this dinner, can you briefly explain how it came together? Yes. Uh in, in the last week of 2016, Michael Wolf, who is a contributing editor to The Hollywood Reporter, sent me a note and said, hey, if you're going to be in New York next week, I live in Los Angeles, if you're going to be in New York, I'm having a casual dinner with the Aleses. So it's Roger and Elizabeth Ailes, his wife. Uh, would you, can you make it? And uh, so I was going to be in town. Uh, and closer to maybe about two days before the dinner, Michael sends me a note and says, believe it or not, I think Steve Bannon might be joining us. So, you know, as an editor, I find this intriguing. Um, and we we show up to Michael's uh, Michael's house in 
New York City. His wife, I'm sorry, his partner, Victoria, has, has made dinner. And uh, in come uh, Roger and Elizabeth. And the night begins. And I understand Steve Bannon showed up late, according to Michael Wolf, showed up uh, like three hours late from Trump Tower. Yes. Yes. So, so it was, it was incredible. So the, uh, so I talked to Roger Ailes, who I, I knew him slightly. Uh, he was uh, amazingly a big fan of The Hollywood Reporter as, an, as someone who grew up in entertainment. Uh, and he and his wife were, uh, we had a pretty spirited discussion about the accusations that mm-hmm. had been leveled against him at Fox uh, and Fox News. He spoke quite candidly about Rupert Murdoch. Um, and uh, there was a lot of personal discussion about the impact that the news was having on his right. son. Uh, and what, one of the really fascinating things about the conversation with Roger and his wife was that in his heart, he truly, truly believed he had done nothing wrong, hmm. and uh, and, Eliz- and Elizabeth. They, I, I, uh, they, they were a couple who, if you didn't know the backstory, if you didn't know all the, right. all the clouds around them, that you would think that this was a very nice older couple in love. I, I want to ask. You, I just uh, want to Elizabeth. Ask, was, sorry, uh, I just, I just yes. want to ask, try to ask you about a few quotes from the book from that dinner. According to the book, Roger Ailes yes. asked Steve Bannon, "quote." What has he gotten himself into with the Russians, meaning then President-elect Trump? Bannon responded, quote, he went to Russia and he thought he was going to meet Putin, but Putin couldn't give a uh, poop, different word you used, about him. So he's kept so he's kept trying. I'm just wondering, did you hear that? And is that accurate? You know, I can't say I. I heard a discussion. I couldn't say verbatim, word for word, because I wasn't taking notes. But that sounds accurate to me. I was the dinner. There were just six. There were just six people, and I was seated between uh, Steve Bannon and Roger Ailes. And there was this um, frantic back and forth between the two of them. And it was it was it was unbelievable. It was like seeing the the Republican agenda being laid out for the next four years. Wow. Uh, one of the things that was very clear about Steve from Steve Bannon. And I just, you know, it was so interesting. Steve Bannon walks in quite late and he's offered a drink right away. And he he very demonstratively says, no, I'm not going to drink. And then he sits down and has some dinner and really just goes into it. And he and Roger Ailes, the two of them, uh, they were basically plotting the future of the Republican Party uh, in the Trump administration. And uh, there were so many interesting things said. They started out, um, they started out talking about the uh, they, they were building the cabinet together. And uh, uh, one of the things they started talking about, the, which was an imminent subject right then, was Rudy Giuliani and uh, his disappointment over not being named secretary of state. And, uh, and Ailes, Ailes, is, Ailes is so funny. He just said, you know what? And he's sort of casual. And he's like, just tell Rudy. Just, I know what you do with Rudy. You just tell Rudy. Uh, just get Rudy uh, photographed twice, coming once or twice coming out of Air Force One. Then Rudy's all good. Wow. And, there, there, there and then are, they started there, talking about John. Sorry, there, there are a couple other quotes I just need sorry. to ask you about, which seem to speak to, yes, to Bannon's assessment of Donald Trump's intellect. Again, from the book, Roger Ailes says, I wouldn't give yes. Donald too much to think about. Bannon's response, too much, too little, doesn't necessarily change things. Again, that exchange, is that something you heard or, or, or how did you int- interpret it if you did? Yes. Yes. I, I, there was, a, there was a, a ongoing theme. And it was, to be clear, Bannon had a fondness for Donald Trump in the night, but he, I can't say he didn't think, it was almost he had a paternal role to Donald Trump. Hmm. He, if, like I, he I, saw I remember himself one above of the first things I said to Michael, he saw himself in control of Donald Trump. That's interesting. When, or in control of the situation. And uh, I, I, there was a consistent theme that maybe Donald doesn't have, Mr., uh, that the president, as and he called him Donald or Mr. Trump occasionally, doesn't have the patience to go through these details. And he laughed about certain things, about how uh, how uh, Donald Trump saw, thought John Bolton's mustache was unattractive. And right, I actually, there were so many things about the way he didn't like John Bolton looked. Yeah. Right, I'm actually going to read so one of those. Those things were absolutely said. I want to read that actually for, directly from uh, from the book um, because, it, again, it, 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 inclu- it includes the, the author's context. context. Uh, quote, uh, actually, it, it asks, does he get it? Um, wait a minute, I'm sorry. I, I want to... I want to read the Bolton one that you just talked about uh, regarding former uh, uh, U.S. uh, U.N. Ambassador John Bolton. Well, he got in trouble because he got in a fight in a hotel one night and chased some woman. uh, That's according to the quote from Ailes. Bannon responded, if I told Mm -hmm. Trump that, he might have the job. Did you hear that? (laughs) Yes. Yes. I mean, there was a lot of there was a sort of a lot of uh, I guess you would call it 
unpolitically correct stuff going back and forth. And I, th I think that was one of the things that was just mind blowing to me was both the level of trust they had in Michael Wolff, that they were saying all this in front of two people who had the ability to put this out in the world. Um, and there was and, no and talk of this being I off the record. They, the, the ground rules at this meal, but when it started, were nothing could be used at that moment. And so later, Michael Wolff, upon, upon Roger Ailes' death, was granted permission by his wife, by his widow, to use the, to use the night. And later, Steve Bannon uh, gave, told him he could make the dinner on the record. Wow, that's fascinating. Hey, Janice Mann, I really appreciate uh, uh, you coming in and talking to us tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. More now from the book. And Wolf says from the president's mouth, making comparisons between his situation, Watergate, and his continued problem with leakers or potential informants. Here he is talking to advisors about that and specifically about James Comey. Quote, Comey was a rat, repeated Trump. There were rats everywhere and you had to get rid of them. John Dean. John Dean, he repeated. Do you know what John Dean did to Nixon? It just so happens we have John Dean, former Nixon White House counsel, with us uh, tonight. So, uh, John, let me ask you. Do you know what John Dean did to Nixon? <laughs> I do. <laughs> well, I'm wondering what you make of the president citing that. I'm sorry? What do you make of the president citing that, I, according to I Wolf? I'm delighted he reacts that way. I think it's a badge of honor uh, with this president, as it, I felt it when I hit the top of Nixon's enemies list. So I think it's good that the president's are aware of Watergate, they're aware of the consequences of Watergate, uh, and maybe he has some crude understanding of Watergate. Wolf also described the president as a, quote, John Dean freak who would go, quote, bananas when you would be on TV comparing the Trump-Russia investigation to Watergate. According to Wolf, the president would talk back to the television about loyalty and what people would do for media attention. Does this sound like a properly functioning president of the United States? Well, I've had difficulty with the functioning of this president uh, from the very beginning. It's one of the reasons I was interested in becoming a CNN contributor when I accepted the, the, uh, the post, uh, because I thought somebody needed to speak truth to this man and let him hear it, uh, the historical comparisons in particular. John, and, uh, Jeff Tubin is also here. I know he wants to ask you a question. Jeff? John, you know, the, we have this New York Times story about Don McGahn at the president's discretion, at request or, or insistence, uh, uh, you know, talking to uh, uh, Jeff Sessions, trying to get him not to recuse himself. Do you, I mean, Don McGahn is one of your successors as White House counsel. Do you think there is any problem, any legal impediment, any reason why Don McGahn couldn't testify about this incident in front of uh, the uh, congressional committee the way you testified about your conversations with President Nixon? In front of a congressional committee, I think it's an open question. If the president invoked executive privilege, uh, he might be able to impose it. If you recall, the, during Watergate, that was the unresolved element of executive privilege. A grand jury clearly had access to the tapes. The Senate Watergate Committee never got access to the tapes. Uh, judge, it stopped at Judge Sirica. He wouldn't. He didn't rule on it. He thought it was a political question. So that's an unresolved issue as far as well, attorney-client privilege. Uh, that's been pretty well resolved by the uh, Ken Starr case. Go ahead, Jeff. Well, why? Why didn't you? Why? Why were you allowed to testify about conversations with the president? Why? Why wasn't executive privilege invoked about that? Uh, I don't know why they didn't invoke executive privilege. Uh, how do you invoke executive privilege? Uh, how, there's no such thing as an injunction to not testify. Uh, they did waive attorney-client privilege. Uh, they knew we were going to blow through it anyway because of the exceptions to the privilege even then. So, so, they, so, the, re so the real issue is, does President Trump tell Don McGahn, I forbid you from talking to Congress about these conversations? That's right. And, and what, what's the sanction is to fire him. Uh, what, what is, uh, I was glad you clarified the issue of his responsibility. Today, that's been clarified post-Watergate. Under Rule 1.13 of the Model Code of Professional Ethics put out by the American Bar Association in representing an organization it's the organization that he owes the loyalty to. Well, John, that was actually my question. So let me just repeat that. 
uh, Don McGahn, his loyalty should not be to Donald Trump, President Trump. It should be to the executive branch, to the White House? It is to the office of the president in his case. That's what he represents, as does uh, uh, Ty Cobb. They, you know, when they're on the payroll of the, of the White House, they, they represent the office of the president, not so, the man who occupies so it. So if, if, if they're aware of some wrongdoing or attempts at obstruction or whatever it may be, they, do they have a duty to discuss that with somebody like Robert Mueller? They have to take it to the highest authority if they are aware of a crime. And that in this, that's, with the president is probably the Congress. That, that's an absolutely critical point, Anderson, that uh, Don McGahn is not Donald Trump's personal lawyer. He does have personal lawyers, John Dowd, Jay Sekulow. They represent Donald Trump, the human being. And if they know of wrongdoing, they are under absolutely no obligation to right. tell anyone. In fact, they are in an obligation not to right, tell anyone because their loyalty is to Donald Trump, the person. Don McGahn is in a very different circumstance. He is paid by the taxpayers. He works for the taxpayers. And his obligation is to the executive office of the president, which happens to be occupied today by Donald Trump. But his obligations are very wow. different from personal lawyers for Donald yeah, Trump. I'm glad we got that cleared up. John Dean, thank you. Jeff Tubin, stay with us. I want to return to the book passage I read at the top of the program. Again, keeping the disclaimers in mind from Michael Wolf and our own uh, about his sourcing. It's the president aboard Air Force One talking about how to characterize the Trump Tower meeting. His son, son-in-law and campaign chairman, talking to Russians. Quote, the president insisted that the meeting at Trump Tower was purely and simply about Russian adoption policy. That's what was discussed, period, period even though it was likely, if not certain, that the Times had the incriminating email chain. In fact, it was quite possible that Jared and Ivanka and the lawyers knew the Times had this email chain. The president ordered that no one should let on to the more problematic discussion about Hillary Clinton. Again, Jeff Tubin is with us, as well as Kerry Cordero and Pamela Brown as well. Jeff, if this part of the book proves to be true, that the president of the United States ordered people essentially to lie about this meeting in Trump Tower, saying it was about adoption, or at least not tell the full story... Does that put him in some sort of legal jeopardy? I mean, th this is obviously something that Mueller has looked into and continues to look into very carefully. We know that not from Mueller, but we know that from witnesses who have gone, uh, who have talked to his office. Because, you know, when the story broke, when the New York Times story broke uh, about uh, the June 20th meeting in Trump Tower with Jared Kushner and the, and, and the Russian lawyers uh, and, and Donald Trump Jr., you know, the initial report was that this was only about adoption, uh, adoption, which was clearly false, for, for, false from the get go. And the question that Mueller is investigating is who instigated this false story? If the, the Wolf book is accurate about this, it suggests that the president was putting out a false story. That's potentially obstruction of justice. It also puts the lie to the fact that the president claimed he didn't even know about this meeting. How could he be giving directions about how to describe a meeting that he later said he knew nothing about? Pam, what do we know um, about how interested Mueller's team is in this trip of Air Force One? Well, I can tell you, Anderson, Mueller's team has been interested in it since basically news broke about the crafting of this statement because very early on, um, we reported, CNN reported, that uh, the president was involved uh, in the crafting of the statement along with others, including uh, Hope Hicks, the communications director. And so, uh, as, as Jeffrey pointed out, Mueller's team has interviewed some of the witnesses who were on that plane, including Hope, looking at intent to, to provide a false statement like this, whether they were trying to conceal information as part of the obstruction of justice probe. As we know, it's not a crime to, to lie to the media, but they're looking at this, we're told, as one piece of the puzzle in the obstruction of justice probe, given the fact this first statement that the president was involved in was misleading and was false. I, I mean, it, it's so, it boggles my mind why the president would, would insist that this was about adoption if he knew and other people on that plane knew that the Times probably had the email chain and that Donald Trump Jr. had the email chain and, and knew what was in it. Carrie, I want to read another excerpt from the book regarding Steve Bannon and the Mueller investigation. Quote, Bannon's tone veered from ad absurdum desperation to resignation. If he fires Mueller, it just brings the impeachment quicker. Why not? Let's do it. Let's get it on. Why not? What am I going to do? Am I going to go in and save him? He's Donald Trump. Do you believe he's right that if, 
if the president found a way to fire Mueller, do you think impeachment proceedings would be inevitable? I think uh, many members of Congress on both sides of the aisle um, view the firing of the special counsel as a red line. Now, it's very uh, a little bit more tenuous in the House. I think maybe that's more true for the Senate than the House, where particularly on the House Intelligence Committee in the last month or so, we've really seen Republican members um, coming more to the defense of the White House and trying to tamp down and discredit the special counsel's investigation. But I think that if that quote represents Steve Bannon's advice, I think at, at the time that it was given, that, that probably, or his sentiment, that that is a sort of well-accepted thought that uh, firing the special counsel would um, certainly agitate the Hill, if not immediately um, cause impeachment yeah. proceedings. Pam, let me read one more excerpt regarding yeah. the, the firing of FBI Director uh, Comey. Quote, most of the West Wing staff, courtesy of an erroneous report from Fox News, was for a brief moment under the impression that Comey had resigned. Then, in a series of information synapses throughout the offices of the West Wing, it became clear what had actually happened. So next, it's a special prosecutor, said Priebus in disbelief to no one in particular when he learned shortly before 5 o'clock what was happening. Now, mm -hmm. according to a source familiar with his thinking, Priebus is denying saying that, but the idea that White House staff could have been so blind, blindsided by the president firing Comey, does that, is that surprising? Uh, no, it's not. And you'll recall that night, Anderson, well, Comey himself, as you know, found out watching the news and he th thought it was a big joke because it said that he resigned on Fox News. But you'll remember that, that Sean Spicer, who was the press secretary at the time, didn't know about it. And he was trying to talk to reporters by the bushes outside the White House in what was a very awkward gathering because he, <laughs> he was also trying to piece together uh, what was going on. It was so close hold that not even the key people who would be in charge of communicating Communicating this information to the media were looped in. It's pretty extraordinary yeah. and goes to the theme of just pure chaos. <laughs> yeah, uh, I got to take a break. Uh, thanks to everybody coming up. How Mike Wolf's new book paints a picture of an internal struggle at the White House that pitted Jared Kushner and Ivanka Trump squarely against Steve Bannon. We'll talk about that next. One notion Michael Wolff's book, Fire and Fury, underscores multiple times is that one of the ongoing power wars uh, in the White House was between uh, Jared Kushner and Ivanka Trump and Team Bannon. One of the skirmishes, Wolf writes, came when the Washington Post reported that Russian Ambassador Sergei Kislyak had discussed allegedly at Jared Kushner's instigation having a private communications channel between the transition team and the Kremlin. Wolf writes that the Jared and Ivanka faction thought Steve Bannon was the source for that report. I'm going to read a passage from the book. Again, this is Wolf's characterization. The exact sourcing is unclear, and as Wolf says in the book, he faced a number of what he called journalistic conundrums because of the White House's lack of experience and procedures for setting parameters for conversations. With that in mind, here's what Wolf wrote. I'm quoting from Wolf. Part of the by now deep enmity between the first family couple and their allies and Bannon and his team was the Jarvanka conviction that Bannon had played a part in many of the reports of Kushner's interactions with the Russians. This was not, in other words, merely an internal policy war. It was a death match. For Bannon to live, Kushner would have to be wholly discredited, pilloried, investigated, possibly even jailed. With me now is Christopher Ruddy, Newsmax CEO and friend of President Trump, and CNN political analyst Josh Green, author of Devil's Bargain, Steve Bannon, Donald Trump, and the storming of the presidency. Chris, good to have you back on. So the rivalry between Bannon and Kushner slash Ivanka Trump was not a secret. Why would the president allow this kind of uh, sort of multiple, you know, city-states or some would call dysfunction to not only come about, but to continue on for months. It's very common in a lot of presidential administrations, Anderson, that you have divisions. Uh, some presidents thrive on it. Reagan had massive divisions, lots of leaks, lots of internal battles. Some people like a very cohesive administration. I think we saw that Obama with Obama and President George W. Bush. Um, I don't think the rivalry was between Steve Bannon and Jared Kushner. If you read the book, the rivalry is between Steve Bannon and Donald Trump. Hmm. I think Steve felt he was smarter and better and brighter than the president. And this book just sort of really brings home that he had disdain for the president, saying, I'm shocked. I've always liked Steve. I've known him for a long time. He's a very fun guy to be with. But some of his opinions of the president to have worked for the president and his family and to accuse Don Jr. of treason 
or saying that the family was engaging in money laundering. If he thought the family was engaging in money laundering, why did, why did he continue working for the president and his family? Um, you know, you start looking at some of these issues and you wonder who's he was fired. When he was fired, Anderson, he told the New York Times the Trump presidency is over. Usually when a White House aide leaves the government, they don't announce to the New York Times the president is over. So Steve has a very exaggerated opinion of himself. And um, I think it's, it's been harmful more to him than it has been to the president, frankly. Josh, I mean, what, what do you think of that? I mean, you've spent a lot of time in conversations with, with, with Bannon. You know, does he have, uh, I mean, does he view, Janice Min was saying at that dinner party, she got the, the sense that C. Bannon felt he was, you know, above the president or could control the president. You know, I don't think that he thought he was above or could control. What, you know, what Janice said I thought was right, that he, that he had a kind of a, a, a paternal there. fondness for Trump, respected his political talents, but thought he needed guidance. And, you know, Bannon's role, he, he, he thought, was, was essentially to be the architect of Trump's campaign uh, and then his presidency, to kind of put meat on the bones and, 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 and take Trump's impulses and kind of craft them into some kind of a governing agenda. Now, that, that went haywire pretty much from day one. And one reason why Bannon was so angry at, at, at uh, Jared Kushner uh, was because as soon as things went off the rails, Kushner, uh, Ivanka, other people in the West Wing recognized uh, that Bannon was responsible for a lot of this and tried to put him out, uh, push him out. Which, which, frankly, is a bit ironic because during the campaign, nobody was closer than Jared uh, and Steve Bannon. There was, there was a kind of an Oscar and Felix quality to them, uh, thick as thieves, and yet they had this falling out pretty much uh, as soon as they got into the West Wing. Chris, do you think Bannon has made a huge mistake here that, that I mean, he's like Icarus and got too close to the sun, that he got this exalted opinion of himself? Um, and, you know, there was even talk of, that supposedly he had floated about possibly running for president if President Trump doesn't, doesn't run again. Do you think he, I mean, whatever support he had or interest he had by people outside who may have liked him, isn't it because of his association with President Trump that he had that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, he, it, who, know, who, who really knew outside of media circles and small political circles knew about Steve Bannon before he joined the Trump campaign? And, and let's not forget, most of and Josh knows about this in the book, most of the primary, all the critical primary states, he had, oppo- he had opposed Donald Trump. He supported Ted Cruz. Right. He was a Johnny come lately into that no, race no, no. Bannon, two Bannon months did. into it. Bannon, Bannon the Mer- did not the Mercer support the supported president. Cruz. Bannon, Bannon was behind Trump all along. Ba- Bannon called me in the fall of 2015 asking if Newsmax would join with Breitbart for Donald Trump to withdraw from the race. And I told him I wasn't going to do that. So he, had, he was opposing the president in all those critical. It was after Iowa, after New Hampshire, when it was clear Trump was going to win that nomination. Um, the, the truth was that Steve Bannon was the chief strategist for the president. When he left, the president had an approval rating of 34%. That was not because of Jared Kushner, Josh. That was because of Steve Bannon doing things like the Muslim ban, the transgender bathroom thing, all these crazy things. Well, that I, th- I, th- I think it was the you know, collective the ineptitude of the Trump White House. Uh, certainly, Bannon so I think, played a major role the, the, in that, but I don't. I don't think so. Don't all think of what we got lost was shoulders. we got we got lost was all the president's great accomplishments: massive deregulation, closing the board, effectively closing the border by up, uh, staging the. The immigration laws, up, upgrading them. Um, the most uh, successful stock market we've ever had in history. Records in business confidence, consumer confidence. Nobody ever talks about this because we're getting into all these sideshows. And a lot of it comes out of, I think, the Breitbart agenda. But Steve's a patriotic American, but he's an isolationist. He's, he's a throwback on a lot of issues that I think where the president really needs to go forward in a more bipartisan approach if he wants to bring those approval number ratings up in the near future. I mean, Josh, you could also argue the president, uh, I mean, I think Chris makes a valid point uh, that a lot of that stuff hasn't gotten the attention that it deserves. Uh, But, you know, you could also point to the president as being responsible for that because every time they have an infrastructure week, you know, he seems to ignore that and just, you know, sends out some rockets, uh, you know, Twitter rockets that grab people's attention. Yeah, I, I think the Twitter feed, Trump's Twitter feed, has a lot to do with that. But look, you know, to, to Chris's point, absolutely. I mean, Steve Bannon was was po- probably the chief agent of chaos 
after the president himself. And of course, that makes it difficult to advance legislation and then to take credit for the legislation that you do manage to advance. Uh, and, you know, in one irony of this flare up over Wolf's book is that uh, Trump finally had managed to achieve something significant in passing tax reform. Uh, and yet a couple days ago, launched off on this tweet storm and now has, has released this statement. Uh, it seems to be busy burying Bannon. And here we are all talking about yeah. something else. Josh Green, uh, Chris Ruddy. Well, uh, who, uh, let's ask uh, ourselves, okay, who, brought, who brought, who brought uh, Michael Wolf into the White House? It was Steve Bannon. Gave him an unlimited access. Uh, put him in front of the president, said yeah. you could trust this guy. This book is, is not only unflattering. I think it's, it's filled with uh, malicious untruths. You know, Steve does not drink, but when you read some of the things he says there, it makes you wonder. Hmm. Because uh, to say that, that Don Jr. committed treason by taking a meeting, it's just absolutely yeah. ridiculous. We've got to leave it there. Chris Ruddy, always good to have you on. Uh, Josh as well. Thank you so much. Coming up next, another story that's breaking, rocking the White House tonight. That could be another key focus of the Russia probe. We'll tell you that ahead.